Coming up on Need to Know, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act could have some unintended consequences on the most vulnerable, children with disabilities. How special education in our public schools may see unbearable funding cuts. That's next. Also on the show, local disability rights advocates were recently detained outside the White House. What they're calling on President Trump to do and if he's responded later on the show. And a complex journey for a local artist unfolds on canvas. How local talent is awakening our understanding of deaf culture through art. Stay with us. A special move to include edition of Need to Know starts right now. districts throughout Rochester are battling a storm of unknowns. The federal health care bill, which is a repeal of the Affordable Care Act, is calling for $880 billion in cuts to Medicaid over the next 10 years. Why does that matter to public school districts? It ultimately affects services delivered to some of their most vulnerable students, those in special education. Susan Hetherington is the director of the University of Rochester's Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities. She stopped by the WXXI studios earlier this week to explain the potential implications of the health care bill when it comes to students. Susan, some people watching right now, they may not realize that there is a correlation between Medicaid and public schools. So can you just briefly explain that connection in particular when it comes to special education? Sure. Uh, in 1975, uh, what's now called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act was passed. Uh, it has never been fully funded, but it requires that we um, provide a free appropriate public education to every student, including those with the most severe disabilities. So the connection is about 30 years ago, it was realized that IDEA is never gonna be fully funded. When it was passed, they said uh, it would be funded 40% by the federal government. It has never been. In 2015, it was 16%. Um, that left the states reeling, because when it says you have to provide a free, appropriate public education, that's with all the services that are needed to provide that education. So about 30 years ago, um, Congress decided that Medicaid would reimburse school districts for uh, help and allied services. And that's, that's the relationship. Perfect. So I, I want to share something with you. The Save Medicaid and Schools Coalition and its member organizations, including the School Superintendents Association, they sent a letter to lawmakers such as mm -hmm. Paul Ryan and Chuck Schumer that was before the House vote uh, on the health bill earlier in May. And a quote from the letter that I'd like to share. The American Health Care Act reneges on Medicaid's 50-plus year commitment to provide America's children with access to vital health care services that ensure they have adequate educational opportunities and can contribute to society. Susan, what does the American Health Care Act, as it stands right now, look in relation to Medicaid funding and reimbursements for special ed? So I'm glad you said right now, yeah. because of course we don't know what it will end up right. looking like. So I will only talk about how the current AHCA yeah. looks. Uh, 
the issue is that $880 billion is going to be cut from Medicaid over uh, 10 years, and uh, a significant portion of the special ed services that are provided are provided through Medicaid. Uh, some of those services are speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, nursing services, um, assistive technology, transportation. It really affects all parts of a child's life who needs those particular services. And those, of course, are the most vulnerable and complex children. So if school districts, and, and correct me if I'm wrong with this, if school districts in the Rochester region and, and those around the country lose some of um, their Medicaid funding or reimbursements for special education services, uh, which, as you said, they are required by law to deliver, who will, f will have to bear the burden uh, of these costs? Um, will states and, and local communities have to raise taxes? Or could some of these positions or services be cut? Do we have any idea? And I know we're, speak, we're looking at how it stands right now, so right. I'll, I'll make sure that I, I emphasize that. It's a little scary. Um, taxes could go up. Eligibility criteria could change. And most concerning is that services would be decreased because um, local uh, entities, school districts, would have to provide those services if they are on the child's um, individualized educational plan. Those are legal documents, so those services have to be provided. Um, so, how are they going to be provided? Either the district pays for them through increased taxes, the state provides more funding, or there are fewer services. And I don't see any way that there wouldn't be fewer services as it stands now. For people who, and as you said, there's there's a long road ahead. It still has to go before the Senate, and we have to see this implemented. Um, so many questions, you know, remain. Um, but for viewers that are watching right now and they're questioning the implications um, of the bill for their own children, uh, for family members in relation to special education, uh, who may receive some of these services, and they're concerned, what would you tell them? Well. <laughs> I would tell them to talk to their Congress people and tell them the stories about their children. I think of a child that we work with, um, I'll call him Timmy, and he's 10 years old. He was born with cerebral palsy. He also has intellectual disabilities. Um, he uses a wheelchair. He has a feeding tube. He gets services. Great little kid. He gets services at home through Medicaid, and he gets services at school through Medicaid. He has to have accessible transportation. Uh, he needs assistive technology. He gets speech therapy and occupational therapy. At home, he gets nursing services, um, uh, accessible um, construction in his home. So it's going to hurt those children in many ways. So we talk about special education, and that's absolutely true. But for the most vulnerable, it's going to hurt them across the board. Susan Hetherington, thank you for your time.
While the health care bill is being considered by Congress, local disability rights advocates are taking action. They're calling on President Trump to support the Disability Integration Act. And they're calling for people with disabilities to have a voice in the health care reform debate. One of those advocates who recently traveled to Washington is Erica Jones of the Center for Disability Rights. She joined a demonstration outside the White House, which led to more than 80 arrests. That's according to the disability rights group ADAPT. Erica joins us in the studio to share more. And welcome back to the show. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. So just to begin, I want to have you break down the Disability mm -hmm. Integration Act. It was introduced by Senator Chuck Schumer. At its core, what is it? What could it do? Just to put it very, very simply, it's giving people with disabilities the right to live in the community instead of being forced to live in nursing facilities and institutions where they don't want to live. They want to live with their families. Under what circumstances would individuals with dis disabilities be forced to be removed from the community and put in these types of environments? So sometimes if you don't have the services and supports that you, you need in the community, um, you are considered at risk. And once you get to that point, then insurance companies and doctors can come in and say, well, we really think it would be better in your best benefit to go and live at this institution where you have around the clock care. Got it. Well, mm -hmm. I want to talk about this because I reached out to Congressman Tom Reed's office to get his perspective on the bill and whether or not he supports it. And I did receive an official statement from his office. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is Congressman Reed will continue to look into the details of this bill as it progresses through the legislative process. We are committed to working with and advancing legislation mm -hmm. to benefit the disability community. We will continue to make sure that we take care of those who need it most. That's from Samantha Cotton, Communications Director for Congressman Reed. Have you been able to get equal representation and buy-in from elected officials on both sides of the aisle? How is that going with this? You know, yeah, actually, uh, it was very surprising. We have had support on both sides. Um, in the House, the bill is being led by a Republican. Um, previously, it was led by a Republican, and we do have quite a bit of, of uh, Democratic support as well on, on this, the Senate and the House. So it's really exciting. This truly is bipartisan. So for those who oppose this mm -hmm. legislation, what specifically do they oppose? Their, their number one concern, their first question is, what is the cost of all of this? When in reality, we're just, it's, it's no added cost. And the costs are coming from the. So, for example, in our state, if it's a hundred thousand dollars to rent a nursing facility, it'd be about thirty or forty thousand dollars for that same person to live in the community. So it is an extreme savings, and that's what we've been telling people: is um, it's no added cost, and you're saving your state's money. There's no reason not to do this. Well, you returned from Washington, D.C. earlier mm -hmm. this month after demonstrating in front of the White House. You called on President Trump to support this legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, this was organized by the disability rights group ADAPT, mm -hmm. and they said that there were 300 demonstrators and 80 arrests by the U.S. Park Police, or mm -hmm. Park Police, and they were immediately released um, and, and given fines. Did you, did the demonstrators, did ADAPT ever hear from the president in response to this? anyone from his office to give a vocal commitment to the cause or to set up a meeting? As far as I know, we haven't heard any kind of response. Um, but we would like to work with them on this. We would like to hear that they support it and ask, ask questions because that's the best thing they can do. I know ADAPT uh, mentioned that they would like the president's daughter, Ivanka mm -hmm. Trump, to be an ambassador to the disability community. Why Ivanka Trump in particular? So. Ivanka Trump is really important because she has come out for women's issues, women's rights, but she has not come out for disabled women's rights. And that is a big distinction. We have different needs. And um, if she were to just simply include us in that coverall statement of women's rights in general, then that would be huge for us. Well, I won't, I'm curious as to where the Disability Integration Act stands right now. I, I understand as of early April, uh, it was signed to a congressional committee. Mm -hmm. How likely is it, in your opinion, based on what you know, that we'll see some movement relatively soon? 
Honestly, I think it's going great. I really do. Um, we just recently had it introduced in the house by um, Sense and Brenner. And uh, so we've got both going. We've got more co-sponsors just in the past couple of weeks. So I think it's going really great. I, I'm really confident that it's going to go through. Well, Erica Jones, Systems Advocate for the Center for Disability Rights, thank you for your time today. To learn more about the advocacy work of CDR based here in Rochester or for services and support, go to CDRNYS.org. Recently, I was introduced to local artist Laurel Hartman. She invited us to her studio, which was ultimately an invitation into her life. As we know with art, there's generally a deeper meaning behind a painting, drawing, or sculpture. With Hartman's work, we're awakened to a life experience with several layers, some of which resonate with many of us and others we've never encountered until now. Take a look. This is kind of a journal, a documentation of, I'm trying to communicate with my painting. The paintings lead me they lead me to try to find maybe some of the darkness inside of me. Laurel Hartman is searching for direction. This wouldn't be the first time the artist has used one of her paintings as a signpost on the road of life. It's not really a, a formal art term, but I call it mapping. So I can see my work on the walls they're all a map of different parts of my life. It kind of sounds a bit cliche, but it's a kind of a form of expression for me, and it's a way for me to help me understand myself and my journey. The maps are like chapters of an autobiography, but text is replaced with textures, and lines, shapes, and colors represent feelings. Something Hartman says is she had a hard time communicating as a child born and raised deaf. Hearing people, they have the opportunity to hear what's going on around them so they can hear other people's conversations. You learn so much and you think about so many things from hearing other people's conversations. And I didn't have that growing up. I didn't have a lot of ways to express my feelings and thoughts. In hindsight, I didn't think my parents really could understand my feelings. But through my paintings, my parents saw that they made me happy. For Hartman, art became a vehicle of self-expression as a child, and now it's also a tool of self-discovery. The artist says today her work is more about satisfying her needs on this journey of life rather than meeting the expectations of others. People look at my work and they say, I don't see you, I don't see Laurel within that painting. My feeling is I don't have to explain to you what it means. A large part of it is visual language and I let people figure out for themselves. Maybe they get it, maybe they don't. I hope they find some beauty of my journey within the paintings. It's a complex journey that I've been on and I want to show that in my work. Laurel Hartman is not only an artist, she's also a faculty member at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf at RIT. That's where artwork by students, alumni, and artists from around the globe is on display at the Dyer Art Center. I'm joined in the studio by Hartman and Tabitha Jacques, the director of the Dyer Art Center. They'll explain what they say when mainstream museums may not understand about the specialty of deaf art. Welcome to both and also to our interpreters today, Angela Hauser and Mandy Mothersell. And it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Tabitha, you were featured in an interview for WXXI's Arts and Focus program. And in the interview you said, people don't understand why it's so important to collect arts done by deaf people. Can you explain just a little bit that importance? Maybe what are people missing that you would like to share? Well, of course. I think deaf culture, it's important to know that we have rules, we have structures, we have our own language, we have our own art in comparison to other minorities. Women's studies, African American studies, there are various studies and deaf studies is the same way. And so for people to look at deaf people as just someone who cannot hear, 
seems kind of trivial because we have an art that's important to analyze and to understand the meaning, the culture, and the rules behind the art, which will aid people in appreciating the complexities within deaf art. You would feel more connected and would appreciate it more if you understand the value within our society. What are some of the complexities that, that art done uh, by deaf artists can teach us? And this goes to both you, Tabitha, and also to Laurel. Well, I guess I'll start. One example is that deaf people who may have a hearing loss, that's not only the type of deaf person there is. There's a wide range of deaf people. Someone who's born deaf into a deaf family, which means they have immediate access to communication growing up. While other deaf people who are born within hearing families don't have that access to communication. So their experience automatically are completely different from those who have deaf parents. Now, I'm not an artist per se as it relates to that, but you show that type of thing in your artwork, Laurel. You could explain that. Yeah, so it, you mentioned a hearing family. Also, not one size fits all for all deaf people within the deaf community. There are subgroups within the deaf community. Um, deaf artists have a way of being able to show different aspects of that community, different emotions, political uh, opinions and different topics within the deaf community. What are some of the themes that, that we may see, and I know this is something that you, Tabitha, you talked about um, in the WXXI Arts in Focus piece, there are some themes, some areas uh, of focus uh, that may be incredibly important um, for art done by deaf people to, to show and to express through their work. What are some of those themes? And I'll give this to, this is to both of you. Okay, well, there are specific themes. Um, for example, with paintings, we may focus on the eyes of a person more and make those larger and make the mouth smaller and the hands bigger and the ears smaller, which represents a deaf person. That may be in some paintings, but... You could also use different colors. Uh, some deaf artists use specific colors to try to show pride. You'd want to show pride using yellow or light colors or show the beauty of the deaf culture and not, uh, not make it about oppression, but show the lightness um, and the value of the culture. And also some artists may express anger as well related to their experiences growing up as a deaf person. It's not limited to one painting or one sculpture or one mixed media. It's such a wide range and we have such a broader type of ways to express ourselves as deaf people and our experiences. Laurel, this is something I did not have in the package that we did, the, the video story, but I thought it was really interesting because you talked, when I got to meet with you earlier, you talked about, um, you described your paintings as a form of visual language and that, and I would just kind of want to have you explain this here, how colors kind of pick you. You allow, as you paint, the journey to unfold and the colors come to you, they may not be pre-selected. Can you explain that just a little bit? <coughs> well... As I mentioned before, picking colors is difficult. My, there's a specific form and approach to color, but I use my intuition. I use an intuitive approach. So what I do, I don't really plan the color. Some colors maybe make me feel more comfortable, and some colors make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, so, I just kind of overlap the colors and maybe some of the colors that are weaker build up of, on top of other colors and there's a lot of overlapping in my work that becomes a new set of color. And I, I have to think about my feelings at the moment and, I, and that's not just because I'm deaf. There's other things in my life that I can put in my artwork. I'm a mother, I'm an educator. Um, so there's different feelings that affect me each day while I'm working. And the color 
has different meanings and can create complexity in certain areas of my painting. People might think of anxiety and they don't think about what color anxiety is. So there's no right color for a mood or feeling. So for me, it's definitely, I just let the color choose me and I just go with it in the moment. So typically, I try to go towards neutral colors and then at that moment, I have more of a blank slate and a blank state of mind and I can just let the neutral colors ask me questions and lead me I mean obviously they're not literally asking me questions but it just kind of it's a back and forth play with my feelings and the colors that I choose. Well the Dyer Art Center <clears throat> has been collecting art from national and internationally renowned deaf artists since the late 60s when the center opened and I want to know what Tabitha are some of the methods uh, that you're using to kind of build this uh, bridge uh, between the art and the work that's being presented uh, in the community at large so they're aware of what you have and what you're offering. Well, we have been doing a lot of really neat exhibits, um, very for informative educational approaches trying to really invite the community and the public into dire art. As I mentioned before, we do exhibits that are about deaf people, but it's various deaf people with varying experiences. And we want people to come and really look and think on them and appreciate the complexity and the layers that our deaf culture incorporates. We try, for example, I really focus on very strong deaf art, but I may also focus on deaf and, such as deaf and women art, deaf and Latina art, various areas so that people can get more of a sense of a person's experience. Very good. Well, a special thank you to my guests. Thank you so much for joining me today. Tabitha Jacques, Laurel Hartman, and interpreters Angela Hauser and Mandy Mothersell. Be sure to check out the work of local and internationally acclaimed deaf artists at the Dyer Art Center at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. You can learn more online at rit.edu slash ntid slash Dyer Arts. And that wraps up a special Move to Include edition of Need to Know. Now, Move to Include is a partnership between WXXI and the Golisano Foundation. Its mission is to encourage thoughtful discussion about issues of inclusion. To learn more, go to movetoinclude.org. I'm Helen B. and Duty Hofer, your host for Need to Know. Thank you for joining me. I will see you next week right here on WXXI-TV.